Okay, it looks like um, we're still getting a few participants signing on. And uh, um, we'll start up and uh, let people sign on as we go. So I'm John Lorsch, Director of NIGMS, and I'm extremely uh, happy to have all of you joining us for this webinar. This is our second series of these uh, webinars that are targeted mainly at trainees, but for anyone in the biomedical research or other communities interested in the topics. Uh, we're very pleased today to have uh, Olivia Rislin and Prachia Vasli. Uh, Vasti talking to us about um, starting up your own lab as an early career investigator. Um, before we start, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, please, as questions arise during the course of the discussion, please send them to me, John Lorsch, um, in the chat box, and I will relay them um, in some kind of order uh, or semblance of order um, to Olivia and Prachi. Um, we are going to be recording this, so um, please be aware of that, but also tell your friends and colleagues that if they miss this, they can find it on our website and watch it at their convenience. I wanted to address a couple of things just up front off the bat before we get started uh, with Olivia and Prachi. Um, the first is, you know, we certainly recognize that um, starting your own lab is, is always something um, that is a uh, challenging um, endeavor hopefully also an exciting endeavor. Uh, but in these uncertain times where we have uh, COVID-19 going on, we have um, you know, difficulties with anti-black racism and racism in general, uh, and, and many other challenges, the economy um, that's suffering uh, due to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, you know, we recognize that the academic job market um, may be um, you know, more than a little unstable at the moment and for the next little while. Um, so we, we'll, we'll try to address that during the course of this discussion. Um, but I think, you know, do, do recognize that, that NIH uh, and certainly the academic community are acutely aware of this problem. And from NIGMS's point of view, in the post-COVID recovery period, um, one of our primary focuses is going to be on postdocs um, and, and trying to help them weather the storm and bridge the gap uh, to getting their their next positions, whatever those may be. So things like extensions of F-32s and K-99s will be considered. Uh, right now, if you are thinking about applying for a K-99 or you're an early stage investigator, um, getting ready to apply for your first grant, um, eligibility can be extended for those, those things, ESI eligibility, K-99 eligibility. Just ask, talk to your program director, and you can request that. Um, I also want to address up front the angry, anguish and outrage that, that much of the country feels related to the deaths of George, the George Floyd, Ahmed Abri, and uh, Breonna Taylor, and, and many, many others um, over the, the decades and the centuries, really. Um, and the long history of anti-Black racism in this country. Um, it's something that we wrote about and posted a, a post on in the feedback loop. Uh, last week. I would encourage all of you to go look at that if you haven't already. It, it has some um, resources that you can look at, particularly those of us in the majority and or in positions of power or authority um, to move forward positive change in real ways um, in the coming weeks, months, and years. Um, we also have a new program I wanted to make all of you aware of called Mosaic, which is a program designed to um, help bridge the gap from the postdoc years into the early career investigator years um, and with, a, with a really uh, targeted focus on uh, improving the diversity of the faculty within research intensive institutions. So there's a K99R0 zero phase, uh, and then there's also um, will be grants given to professional societies to help provide um, skills building and career mentoring uh, for the K99 and R00 fellows. So, uh, look at that yourself, spread the word, Mosaic. Um, we should be giving the first awards in that soon and continuing the program and hopefully growing it. So um, the last thing I wanted to say is that this is the second series, as I mentioned. Um, the next webinar will be Thursday, June 25th. Uh, that's also going to be a very special webinar. It's uh, from 2 to 3 Eastern time. It's going to be on leadership and management as a scientist, and we're very lucky to have Shirley Tillman the former president of Princeton University and a really esteemed molecular biologist, and Guy Padbury, senior vice president of Merck and Company, uh, and um, a preclinical a pre researcher um, of some renown in his own right as well. So I hope you can join us for that. 
then, uh, without any further ado, um, I would like to not introduce our two uh, panelists, uh, Olivia Rislin and Pratia Vasti. They are going to introduce themselves as part of uh, what they're going to tell you about. So take it away. I think we're going to go to Prachi first, right? Yep. Uh, thank you so much, Sean. Um, I really appreciate um, this opportunity, and I'm really glad um, that all of you are here with us today. Um, so my name is Prachi Avasti. I'm a cell biologist. I'm about two weeks from officially being an associate professor and I'm moving my lab this summer from University of Kansas to Dartmouth. Um, and my lab studies how regulation of both the microtubule and actin cytoskeleton controls assembly of this sort of sensory organelle called the cilium. But when I'm not nerding out about the cytoskeleton, I'm involved in a lot of different initiatives that tackle what I think can be improved for me and others in science. Um, so I'm on the board of directors of the preprint advocacy organization, ASAP Bio, the board of directors of the open, um, open access journal eLife, and the steering committee of rescuing biomedical research, which is concerned with the overall sustainability of the biomedical uh, research enterprise. I also started a peer networking community called New PI Slack, which I'll describe briefly in a moment, um, and is very pertinent to our discussion here. So I just wanted to start off with just a few initial remarks before I kick it to Olivia. And I want to start off by saying that there are probably about as many ways to run a lab as there are people doing it. Um, the best thing about this job, in my opinion, is that you get to choose. Uh, you can cherry pick the best lessons from your previous mentors or rebel against them. You, can, uh, you will get a ton of advice, um, but you get to decide what kind of scientist, mentor, and leader you want to be. Um, and through this discussion, I will argue for bringing your unique talents um, to your science and your practice of it. Um, and it's not just people like John that are in a position to set the course. Um, each and every one of us has the power, and I would argue the responsibility to, uh, with our individual decisions to sort of improve our corner of science. Um, so it's your job to find your voice, find your scientific voice, how you wanna do science, how you interact with others in science. There's always gonna be an army telling you to sort of follow the rules until um, you're safe or that you have permission to sort of abandon your principles or your vision because you're vulnerable or inexperienced. Um, and I would say that the spoiler is that we're always learning and that, um, and that there, the day may never come that you really feel truly safe. And so um, while you're always gonna be taking a risk whenever you deviate from the status quo, it is your individual strengths for which you will be hired and rewarded. Um, so I encourage you not to dilute those things. Um, so in that vein, I will just um, plug something that I mentioned earlier that takes advantage of the individual strengths of PIs and uses it to collectively help the group, which is new PI Slack. Um, it's an online network now consisting of more than 2,000 PIs from almost every continent. Um, so I started this network in 2016 when I realized that everyone starting a lab had faced the, you know, faced the same cha challenges and we didn't need to exhaust ourselves sort of reinventing the wheel for every mundane decision, but we could also use the ingenuity of each person to spark better ways of, of doing things. So my first advice is to join that group um, uh, as you start your, <laughs> start your lab. Um, and so you don't have an end of one or two from your senior mentors, um, but you can benefit from the thousands of peers in addition to the best advice from their own senior mentors. So you can ultimately use the wealth of that information and pertinent experience to make the best individual decision for you. Um, so you can probably take all sort of highly specific advice uh, with a heavy grain of salt, but what I'm advocating for more generally is to find your own voice in science, both to advance your career and bring your unique strengths to the table. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there and hand it over to Olivia. Great. Well, I just want to start by thanking John for the invitation to take part in this and thanking you all for joining us. I'm I'm really excited for this conversation, partly because I'm really excited to hear what, more about what Prashi thinks, um, because she's really been a, a source of inspiration for me since I first came across her on Twitter in, I guess, 2016. Um, so a little bit about me. I am an assistant professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. My lab studies RNA and specifically what happens to, it on, to RNA in the cytoplasm. So we really want to understand how messenger RNA is degraded, um, how translation is controlled and really how those two processes talk to each other. And I have to say that understanding post transcriptional regulation has really been a love affair for me that started really when I was a first year graduate student. Um, so I can also talk about RNA for a very, very long time, but I will hold off um, briefly, at least on that topic. Um, I also want to tell you a little bit about my academic history, just so you all sort of understand where I'm coming from, and also maybe appreciate that there is no, there is no trajectory that you have to take. 
So I grew up in uh, the Boston area. I went to Brown for undergrad and then I went over to the UK for graduate school. Um, and I have to say, even there that that was, I really didn't know what I was getting into if I'm being fully honest. And so I think I sort of made it through that system by a, quite a lot of dumb luck. I then started my postdoc at the Whitehead um, with Dave Bartel, where I worked on microRNAs. And then I started my lab at uh, the Hospital for Sick Children, University of Toronto, up in Toronto, Canada. And then I moved three years after starting my lab to the University of Colorado. And I bring this up because I think one aspect that I did not appreciate is when you start your lab is that you can move. If things aren't the way you want or there's a better opportunity, you don't have to stay at that first faculty position forever. And I want to mention this now because I think I had a, a, a real misconception when I started my lab about how frequent this was. And one thing I've learned from the new PI Slack community is that people move a lot and that's fine. Um, the other thing I want to say in this introduction is that there are challenges for running a lab. Running a lab is not easy. There are, it's hard writing grants. It's a challenge managing people. There are a lot of things that you're sort of learning on the fly, especially right now um, during this, during COVID. But I also think it's a pretty amazing job. Like essentially every day I get paid to think about science and to be curious and to read papers and to figure out how we're going to discover something. And that, is amazing that feels amazing to me and i just hope for all of you that as you move forward in your careers you can hold on to that excitement because if you can if you can stay close to the science if you can still feel your curiosity feel that excitement of discovery i think that makes a lot of the other bits of it a lot more palatable because you get this huge reward of what we all love about science which is discovering something that no one has seen before and you now don't just get to have it for yourself, but you get to see your trainees also experience that. And that is hugely rewarding. And to be honest, I, th I just think this is an amazing job. So I will, I will stop gushing there. Um, I think we can start with the questions at this point. Well, awesome, thanks so much to both of you. Um, you know, reminding everyone to send in their questions to me. I've already got a few, so that's great, but keep them coming because we have, it's a great opportunity to hear from uh, these two amazing early career investigators and get their advice. So what advice do you have for people who are just starting out in their searches for an independent faculty? So let's even go before, you know, you've got your job. There, there are a lot of postdocs, grad students. What advice would you give them about searching for a faculty position? Why don't we start with, let's start with Prachi and then go to Olivia. Sure. Um, so obviously we want to take current events into account and just uh, acknowledge what John said at the top of this session that obviously people are concerned about sort of the academic job market and, and I completely understand that. Um, and, um, you know, one thing that my feeling generally has been is that um, we don't really you know, take into account the full spectrum of academic jobs. You know, we sort of are familiar with our little corner of, of science. And, you know, even when we, when we tell trainees when they're trying to decide on their career path to do sort of informational interviews to decide on different career paths, but I think the same thing could apply to um, looking at different types of academic jobs, right? At, at different types of institutions, um, in uh, geographically diverse places and in, um, you know, whether it's a medical school or an undergraduate institution or, you know, whatever it may be um, to sort of really understand what all those different jobs are and how the balance between research and teaching and, and, and all of those things are at all of those places. So I really encourage people to do a little bit more digging um, to really understand what all of those different types of academic jobs are. Um, and that will allow you to you know, both broaden your horizons, but also narrow your focus into the things that you are actually more interested in. So it sort of lets you refocus your, um, um, you know, uh, targets for where you will apply. Um, and then I would, and, and then, you know, I think people have a lot of different methods about going about this, but, um, I think once you have that, you know, broadening and then narrowing, you can, you can cast a wide net and, and, you know, keep in mind that, 
um, you know, it's that you are looking for that place that's a right fit. And I will say that I have been wrong at every point in my career of where I thought that right fit would be just and just ahead of time, you know, when you go on interviews, whether it's for postdoc interviews or, or faculty interviews, you have this conception in your mind of what you think is going to be the right place for you. And then you actually go there. And then there are places that completely win you over. And there are complete places that you think, oh, no, this is really not for me. Um, and, and often we don't know, um, you know, we don't really, we're not in the heads of the search committee members necessarily, right? So we don't know, um, you know, what it is that they're necessarily looking for. And I have often found that places that I sort of just applied on a whim, you know, you go there and interview and you think like, oh, I am a really good fit for this position based on what they're looking for. But you would never have known that from the job ad. So I think that, um, you know, not overly restricting yourself in that way is always useful. So I think that's sort of my two cents is, is to really uh, attack the initial problem in this sort of systematic way by doing these inter informational interviews and learning about different types of academic jobs so you know what you want and then, and then casting a wide net. Great, Olivia. What do you think? Yeah, I think I, I agree completely with everything that Prachi just said. And I would maybe add a, a couple other points um, more specifically. So, um, you know, the first thing to think about is in any job transition, any transition, you really have to look within yourself first and really understand the things that make you tick, things that you, you need in an environment, the things that you don't need in an environment. Because at the end of the day, you are the one who is going to be living with your decision. And if you have not been honest with yourself up front, if you have sort of taken the shoulds of everyone else and used those to guide your decision, well, those people aren't going to be living in your life. You are. Um, and I think that can be a challenge sometimes to, to really be fully honest with yourself. And I think this is really important because if you know what you need, then you know how to evaluate a place that you're going to. And at the end of the day, you don't just want any job, you want a job where you're going to thrive. And so in th that you are going to find by sort of being honest at the outset. The other thing that I would say is that I think sometimes building off of what Prachi says, we read job advertisements and we think, oh, you know, I'm not a good enough fit. I don't have enough publications to apply to that department. I'm not, I'm not whatever, 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 right? And you, you opt yourself out of these opportunities. And I'll be fully honest, I did this when I went on my job search the first time. There were departments and searches where I was like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't have enough papers. I can't apply to that. And I didn't apply. And now looking back, I'm like, why didn't I apply? I mean, what's the worst that would have happened? I wouldn't have been invited for another interview. I mean, that's fine. So if something looks appealing to you, just, you know, just apply and let someone else sort of say no or say that you're not the right fit. The final thing, this again is touching a little bit on the scenario that we're in right now is COVID is really hard, right? Because there are a lot, there's a lot of information that you're not going to be able to get now. And this decision, part of the stress of it comes from the fact that we have incomplete information and the information that we do have is not entirely predictive of what life is eventually going to be. But I would say that how search committees, how potential colleagues are dealing with the situation, the types of ways that they're reaching out, the types of ways that they are treating those interviews, that's all information that you should be taking into account. Departments, I really, I really firmly believe are showing sort of their true selves right now, what it's really going to be like to be a member of that department going, going forward. And that is important information that you should use. Because at the end of the day, it's not just that you want a job, you want a job that you're really excited about. Yeah, that's great. I think a great theme is remember that people giving you advice aren't going to be living your life. That's a really good point. Um, so we've got tons of questions. So let's get to some more of them. Um, so now we've you got you got your job. We have a number of questions from people who say they're going to be starting their lab within the next six months. Um, what advice do you have for them in terms of preparing just in general? Um, to start your lab when you're not yet there. And then more specifically, you know, to, to the point about COVID-19 in this particular environment. So maybe we can address those things. Olivia, you want to start this time? We'll go to Prachi. Yeah, sounds great. So I think one thing that is important to remember, and I think actually all new PIs, when they start, you feel, I think, this pressure to get things going as quickly as possible. You sort of feel like, 
all right, I've got, I've got tenure coming up in, you know, X years, I've got to apply for my first grant, I've, you know, I've got to keep up with the field, I have these competitors, blah, 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 and you are coming out of this scenario where you were really productive as a postdoc, and there's this, this pressure to get something on the board, um, and certainly I felt this my first year, and so then, for me at least, when I started, I felt like every single setback was just like this huge blow that was going to ruin my career, oh, I can't get my TC incubated for a month, I mean, that's a month, right? But at the end of the day, it's, it's only a month. And science works over, it works over longer timescales. And the timescales for success in running a lab are, are also longer. And so I think my first piece of advice would be to just, just be kind to yourself right now. It, it's okay, it's going to take a while. That's, that's, that's part of it. And everyone who starts their lab and everyone who's starting their lab, especially right now, is going to face that. So I think the first thing I would say is just, just kind of breathe a little bit and take the time that you need to kind of get your feet underneath you. I think there are some real practical challenges, right? Like how do you hire people so that you can start doing experiments if there's a hiring freeze at your university? Um, how can you even start ordering things if perhaps you know you need lab renovations? And I mean, to be honest, those are really, those are really tough things to deal with. And there's no easy solution that Prachi, John, or I can give you that are going to solve them. I think my, my suggestion would be is to focus on what you can do, focus on the things that you can do right now, and just move those things forward, and, and sort of trust the fact that the rest of it will eventually catch up. So maybe you can't officially hire people, but you could start interviewing people. Or maybe you can think about, okay, do I, do I need to become a member of a graduate program to be able to get graduate students? How does that process work? Are there, are there things that I want to learn about to help me be able to hire somebody or to be able to go in this new direction? Essentially, do what you can do now. And I think just try to be, try to understand that this is a really difficult time and it will be okay. Great. Prachi. Yes, I agree with everything Olivia said. Um, there is no time at which your first year will, year will feel like it is going fast enough for you. I guarantee it, it will be frustrating and it will, nothing will move as fast as you want it to. And you probably won't even know how to make it go faster because you're sort of just learning how administration works and more learning even who you need to talk to. You're probably in a totally new institution and you don't even know who to talk to to get something done. You know, it's everything feels like it's 10 steps just to get to the thing you want to do. So it will be frustrating and it will be slow. And that's why one of the things, you know, um, someone had asked on Twitter about how, you know, how are we going to navigate starting a lab during COVID? And, and, and the point that I wanted to make was that, um, you know, in many ways, it, 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 you know, yes, there are, there are challenges that you may not be able to get into the lab and may not be able to do certain things. Um, but that is often the case anyway. You, you sometimes don't have access to your lab space. You sometimes, you know, have that piece of equipment that's on back order for six months all of a sudden <laughs> that you were not planning on that in your, in your um, sort of schedule. Um, so th th these sorts of setbacks are very, very common. So even though COVID is new to all of us um, and new to everyone, um, it is, um, you know, these types of unexpected delays are not uncommon in the first year. So, so I agree with Olivia that, that you can move forward on these different things. One thing I would say is, I, it's gonna sound like kind of a broken record, but I do think, you know, um, the, one of the benefits of new PI Slack is that, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel for everything. So you can get things like, uh, lists of interview questions from dozens of people all in within minutes. You know? So there are certain things that you just don't need to spend a lot of time doing, and that allows you to focus your time on things you do need to spend your time doing. Um, and so that that's, that's one thing. Another thing that um, uh, my former program officer actually um, suggested that, you know, reach out to your program officer um, at the NIH, someone who you think is, is, is aligned with your research interests and you can get feedback on some of your ideas or uh, floats in specific games pages, see if it's a right fit for, for their portfolio. Um, so these are things that you can do. Reaching out to people is always something that you can do, um, whether it's reaching out to people at your institution to understand, you know, how these administrative structures work, reaching out to your program officers, you know, reaching out to prospective candidates for different positions you have openings for, um, you know, advertising those things, setting up your lab website, you know, making sort of um, your, your presence um, known in the, the presence of your lab. As many of you will know, it's, it's difficult as a brand new PI and you're sort of trying to recruit amongst many more senior people at your 
institution. So that's always a challenge that, that um, early career people face. Um, so you really want to make your name for yourself so that you can um, attract people to your lab. So, you know, getting that presence out there is also something you can spend time doing. There's, there's sort of no shortage. Um, it, it's, you know, it may feel like you're slowed down during COVID, but the truth is there's, there's actually a hundred things you need to do all of them yesterday. So, you know, there's there's no shortage of, of things that you can make progress on. Um, and it may be a little bit difficult to be able to move forward on some of those things given the circumstances, but um, but but it will move forward. And and then I echo everything um, Olivia said about um, it's gonna be frustrating, but but you'll do great. Great. <laughs> Maybe if I can just add one other thing that occurred to me while Prachi was talking is that certainly when I started my lab and actually then even when I moved it, for both of those sort of first setup years, I felt like I had very little time to do any type of real scientific thinking. You know, you're, you're just trying, as Prashi said, you're trying to do these hundred things, all of which you wish had been done yesterday because nothing is moving at the pace that you want it to move. And so you can come to the end of a week and you're like, well, what have I, like, what have I done? What science have I done? I've done nothing. I've just been sending emails. And so one thing I, I would suggest is you know, you probably wrote a research proposal when you went on the job market. These were the things that you were planning to do. Some time has passed. Do you still think those are the best experiments? Do, are those still the best projects? Do you have new ideas? What would those ideas look like? What do you need to put into place to make those ideas happen? And almost give yourself a little bit of the freedom to evaluate the science that you're gonna start off doing. Because why not start off doing science that you are most excited about like why wait for that and this can be a really good opportunity where you are have this enforced time where you have to take a little bit of a step back and i would also suggest that i think thinking about science in the midst of all of this other stuff is actually a really great way to keep yourself feeling connected to the science and still feel somewhat excited about this new position great lots of questions about hiring now so let's go to the hiring phase the first one is, in general, are there rules? Should you start with a technician, a postdoc, uh, recruiting a grad student? What's your thinking? Prachi. There are no rules and don't listen to anyone tells you that, who tells you that there are. Amen, amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is one of those things that everyone has a very strong opinion about this. And if you talk to 10 people, they will tell you 10 different answers. So I would not fall in the trap of thinking that, you know, your research program is, you know, depending on what your science is, depending on, you know, you may have a research program that requires a mouse technician or that requires a, you know, you don't, depending on what, you know, what you're doing, it might be very, very specific. Or, and in, in also, one thing about graduate students is that they always tell you, oh yeah, you're a new person, you'll have no problem attracting graduate students. Depends on your circumstance, depends on your department and, and who else is in your department. Um, so you don't always get a choice in whether or not you know, when your flood of grad students is going to come, whether it's going to be in that first year or maybe it's in year three, you know, so certain, some of these things are not necessarily up to you. And, and often I think that the most common thing that I see uh, from new PIs is their immediate rush to hire another one of them. So their first instinct is, I want to hire a postdoc. I want to hire former me. You know, I, I know me, if I had just another one of me in the lab, <laughs> I could just, you know, you know, knock it out of the park. And so it's very tempting to try and recruit a postdoc early on. And I will say that as a new PI, it is often very challenging, as you can imagine, because postdocs have the choice of brand new untested PIs and very senior senior mentors. And so it is always a challenge for new faculty to recruit new postdocs. So A, I would say there are no rules. B, it's not always up to you <laughs> because you have to recruit these people. It's not just about who you're hiring. You have to recruit them, which is work and actually um, things that you should be thinking about, how to, how to best um, position yourself for recruitment. Um, and then um, beyond that is it's a really programmatic decision based on your on your research research program. So I guess I would, um, it's the only thing I can say that's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia. Yeah, I think maybe another way to put it is just as like there's no right way to make your first hire, make your first couple hires, I would actually say there's probably no, really no wrong way to do it either. Um, there are many, many ways to get from where you are to having like a really vibrant lab. Um, and so I think this kind of goes back to what I said earlier. Sorry, I now have a cat who's like trying <laughs> to push my computer off. Um, you know, I think 
one thing that's really important is again recognizing what you need and the types of people that you're going to be able to work with i one thing that i realized after i made a couple of hires that i wasn't totally thrilled with is that like i don't want to work with people who are jerks like i just i felt like it took me too long to get here and i want to like everyone that i work with and so that means that for me when i'm making hiring decisions it's really important that i have a process to try to assess whether or not they're, they're going to be a jerk. And if I don't really care how brilliant or how hardworking they are, if they are, are selfish and not giving to the team, then that's not, that's not somebody I want in my lab. Um, and so I think this is where thinking about what you need from a, a personality perspective is also, is also really important. And then once you know that, then you have to figure out questions that you can apply in a fair way to get at the heart of that. Mm -hmm. Because I think there's also something else you want to be really conscious of, even in your first hire, is that however you're making your hiring decisions, that you're doing it equitably, you're doing it fairly, and you're not using proxies to, to make those hiring decisions, proxies that aren't really getting out at what the core of the issue is. Yeah, so those are really important points. Sorry, um, can I just say one other yeah. thing that Olivia reminded me of, which was that, um, you know, I think that one thing that cannot be divorced from the hiring decision is that it is also a mentoring decision, right? So we are training all of these people and we have a responsibility to do that, right? So I think it is often a common mistake where people say, well, I want someone with skills A, B, C that can hit the ground running on whatever thing. But the truth is, you're going to be training all of these people or and you and you have a responsibility to get them to their next career stage it doesn't matter whether they're a technician or whether they're a student or a postdoc or whatever position that they hold you are going to be you know uh training these people and you're going to be fulfilling a mentorship role and so this you know that hiring decision cannot be divorced from that responsibility and making a decision on the basis of of, of how you were going to train yeah that that led into the question i was going to ask you exactly Right. So someone was asking about, you know, how do you pick the best graduate student? Um, you, know, what, you, you basically answered it, but any elaboration on that? Yeah, I would, I would just say that I think that that become, again, that is not, um, you know, this is a two-way decision and it's always important to remember that, that when you are interviewing people, they are interviewing you. And so it's really important that, that you, I try to, you know, you put yourself you know, you, you wear everything on your sleeve, make sure that everybody knows what they are getting when it comes to your, you know, mentorship style. Um, and so this is something that pretty much the first conversation I have with literally anybody who's considering coming to the lab is, is giving them an idea of who I am and who the, who the lab is. And so, so they have a really, really good sense of what they're getting into. Because one thing I want is I want people who want to be who, you know, who hear what the lab is about and are excited about that, you know, that it, it's a mutually good fit, that they are, that they see what we are about and how we do things, how we do science, how the things we care about, the, the way we, the way we operate. And then they think, well, that is for me because it, you know, no one wants to have people in the lab who are unhappy. Right. So, and, and, and so it's really important that you don't do this like bait and switch thing. You know, you make sure that everyone knows what they're getting. And then I look for mutual excitement on that front that, that, that they sort of buy into sort of my shtick, you know? <laughs> Anything to add about grad students, Olivia? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's a, I, again, totally agree with what Prachi said. I think another way to think about it is that um, creating great science at the heart of being a PI, this is now a collaboration. And it's no longer you at the bench, right? You are collaborating with another scientist to hopefully do really exciting science together. And, you know, really at the core of any collaboration then is making sure that the two scientists get along together. And that can be, that can be many different ways. You know, maybe you have complementary strengths that build off each other. Maybe, you know, you really push each other or, you know, maybe you build on each other. I mean, there are many different ways to do that. But at the core of it, this is a, now a collaboration. And so that, that personality aspect becomes really important. I will say for me, what has worked really well for me and was actually very useful when I started my lab is thinking not about where someone necessarily is at the moment that they're rotating or the moment that they're applying to the lab, but where could they be in a year or in two years? Because that's the type of, of investment that you're making in a person. And for me, I felt like, well, you know, if someone's coming in and they're motivated, 
they're willing to work hard, they are willing to learn and listen um, from with me. And if they're, you know, excited about RNA, like those are all things that I can work with. Like those are traits that like I know I can work with. I can teach somebody how to do Western blot. Like that's that's sort of the easy side of things. It's this other personality aspect of it. that's a lot harder. And if I have for me, these key raw ingredients, like I know that we will kind of will fly together. And every time I sort of followed, I followed those traits, I've been really happy with our relationship at the end. And it's the times where I haven't listened to myself about this, that I've ended up with someone that I'm, I'm not so excited about and it, where it hasn't been as productive a relationship. Just elaborating on that slightly, you know, Prachi made the point about looking for, you know, people tending to look for another one of themselves. And, and I think you were talking before about, you know, putting aside um, things that are proxies uh, because they can lead to biases. When you're selecting people though, you know, that fit is incredibly important, but how do you also mitigate against, um, you know, bringing biases to the table that may be, you know, in increasing the systemic, you know, biases that are in the system. Any thoughts on that? This is a hard one for sure. Maybe I'll start and I'm sure Prachi will have more words of wisdom. Um, I, th I will be honest. I think it's really, really hard. It's really hard to see your own biases. I actually think the first place to start is to recognize that you have biases mm -hmm. and to understand that that's never going to be something that's finished this is always an ongoing process where you always have to look back and self-evaluate. Um, and I think to also recognize that any individual hiring decision, it's going to be really, really difficult for you to know whether a bias came into that hiring decision. You really, with these types of things, are going to see it when you can look over many hiring decisions because that's, that's sort of where you can go from, oh, well, this person in particular made sense because of whatever post hoc rationalization. But if you see over a period of time, you know, hey, I seem to, you know, only hire, you know, white women with brown hair who are runners who like cats. So, you know, like that might be telling me something. Um, I think also going into it with some awareness that you're probably going to feel an affinity to people who have had similar histories to you who, or who have, um, you know, similar outlooks to you. And you, I think you can actually already do that at the interview stages originally. So, you, you know, you get your applications, you're deciding who to interview. And the first thing you can do is like, look through that interview pile. Does everyone seem to come from a university that I've heard of? Are there other people who have had non-traditional backgrounds? And I think having these checks along the way is going to be the, the first step. And also exposing yourself to scientists who look different and who have had different backgrounds from you. The more exposure you have, the more you can break down this image that you have in your mind of what a scientist looks like. Yeah. Rachi, you have any further? Yeah, and I would just add that I think one really good way to sort of circumvent this is to you know stick to the script and stick to a rubric, is having sort of dimensions along which you are going to evaluate. And it's very easy to get into a situation where you're interviewing someone and you have a fantastic conversation and you think, God, that person was great. And then they leave your office and you think, I know nothing about them. And I, you know, I did a lot of talking, first of all. <laughs> and then, and I, I, I heard less from them. And I also sort of um, don't know the answers to many of these important questions, um, just because you're having this informal conversation with someone you get along with. And so I think that it's really important to have that sort of formalization, like I'm going, you know, these are just good interview practices. Ask the same question of every person, you know, so that you can compare across those and, you know, and have that ahead of time before you ever meet a person and have a chance to, you know, make biases that, that would, uh, you know, to, to overweight certain questions because you want it to fit that person that you like, you know? So I think having, you know, some sort of formalization of your process, it can take away some of these biases, that's, you know, and, and just, and, and re put reminders, you know, there are studies that show that just asking people to sort of consider, like, like Olivia said, just consider your biases when you, when you are making these decisions will um, sort of get you to reevaluate through that lens, um, which is always a good check on top of that. Uh, there's a great example of a professional skill that should be taught to everyone in grad school, but isn't, right? I mean, how to do an interview in a systematic and effective way. We're just thrown into it, you know, when we start our lab with no one ever telling us what to do. I think that's a great point. Um, 
And Lost. actually, if I can, sorry, Here, John, if I can just build yeah. on one final thing. Um, you know, the other thing to think about, especially if you haven't done hiring before, is you don't actually have to do it all by yourself. You can mm -hmm. ask colleagues to help with the interview or to talk with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, first of all, that's a really great way of making sure that you haven't done that. Oh, I really like this person, so I'm going to hire them without having sort of done, done some of these checks. But also think about, you know, are they talking to a diverse group of people when they're when they're coming and interviewing? Because that diversity will bring a diversity of perspectives on on a candidate. And it doesn't mean that you have to listen to what everyone says. And just, you know, we all know academics, right? All of us have our own different opinions and we all want to be heard. It's OK to disagree with some of your senior colleagues. But hearing those opinions and those different perspectives is a really good way of providing some checks against your own bias. So lots of questions about scientific priorities here. How did you guys decide what you were going to work on, what you're going to propose to work on, and what you're going to actually work on um, in, in your labs? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So you know, when you asked that question, I immediately thought of um, this is a really big challenge because, you know, when you are a postdoc, you probably have notebooks and notebooks full of ideas that your two hands just can did not have enough time to tackle. Right. And so so you have these these millions of ideas, but you you don't have infinite resources and infinite hands to really do them all at once. Um, but, you know, I have always been of the of the opinion that you know, that we, we sort of, again, cast a wide net and try different things and see what takes off. This is how I do science in general, you know, is to, you know, go with what I, you know, my very best guess for a good idea and, and, and do some tests. Just try to, try to try out as many things as possible and almost always something will win out or you'll get excited about a result or something else will take over and then you will, you know, be able to do that. And, and you know, yes, you have to sort of think strategically about, um, you know, in my opinion, when you, when you apply for, for funding, Thing, you know, your history of training is very much emphasized, right? Like, what are you sort of an expert on and are you qualified to be working on? And so that sometimes is, you know, it's, it's hard, for example, to like, there are things I'm like extraordinarily excited about that we work on that, you know, I was never really formally trained to do. And it's, it's harder to get funding for those things, right? Because you're not like a recognized expert from your training in those aspects. So, you know, that, you know, requires collaborations and things like that. And so, but I would say that, you know, having, you know, letting, getting that, you know, you're going to need that preliminary data. So, so trying a lot of different things that you're excited about you know, something will almost always, you know, take off that you can really pursue and uh, refine as you go along. Olivia, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, well, perhaps unsurprisingly, I completely agree with Prachi. I think um, certainly my tendency as a scientist has been to be one, I'm interested in a lot of scientific questions. So in fact, you know, I think my real challenge is prioritizing, not sort of going like this, to be honest, when I was a postdoc, I had those like notebooks of projects that I was going to do. And I thought, oh, when I have my lab, I'll finally be able to do all the projects that I want to do. And it turns out, no, I just have more project ideas at this point. <laughs> like it's, it's the ratio of what we're doing to what I want to do appears to be sort of a constant of the universe. Um, but I think, you know, I think something that people often do, especially when you're feeling really nervous, right? And I think this happens also at the beginning of postdocs. People say, okay, well, I'm really nervous. I want to look productive. So I'm going to do a safe project. I'm going to do a project that gets me an easy paper. Well, the fact of the matter is like safe projects, easy papers, like that doesn't really exist. They're all hard projects. They're all hard papers. They all require revisions. And so I sort of have this feeling of if I'm going to do science, I'd rather do the science that I feel like is really exciting because for me, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. That's what I like. That's why I'm a scientist is because I want to discover something. And the, the safe projects often don't sort of motivate me or get me excited the same way. That is not to say that a safe project can't lead you somewhere exciting. It's just that that's sort of a, a serendipitous moment that's really hard it, to foresee. So I would say, you know, when you're starting, figure out the things that you can do, things that you can do with the things that you have up and running, and, and just explore and be willing to change your mind, be willing to change your priorities, um, and be willing to accept that your original ideas also might be wrong. If you get that result that does not match, I mean, we all know this, right, that anomaly 
Mm-hmm. Don't just like push it under the rug because it hasn't, it doesn't fit with what you want to, your R01 to look like. There might be something really, there might be something really exciting there that's worth your time to dig in a little bit more deeply. Absolutely. And, and th- there's a perfect segue into the next series of questions, which are about grants, of course. So, um, you know, when should you apply for grants? What grants do you apply for? Talk about your experiences there and, and, and how what you were just talking about, about safe versus ambitious, um, fits into that. I think there's no substitute for, um, you know, writing a lot of grants. There are, there are a lot of different schools of thought on this. So if you, you know, ask this question in UPI Slack, you would get a range of answers from people who think, you know, you don't want to put out a half-baked grant and you don't want to, and you want to make sure you get that first, you know, this is the, actually the, the advice that I got, the sort of conventional wisdom that I had heard, you know, from the universe when I started was pretty much, you know, oh, you want to get that first paper out because you're going to need that paper in order to get the grant, you know, and so, you know, focus on getting that paper. And I actually, you know, ultimately, I don't agree with this sort of thinking. I think that, you know, uh, it's really important to be open with your science and get a lot of feedback. And that includes on grants, too. And so, you know, you know, this, I, you're not necessarily going to land your first grant, right? So it's an understatement, but <laughs> I'm trying not to totally understate that, but it's a, um, you know, um, my feeling is that, you know, there's going to be a lot of opportunities, especially when you're early, there's a specific unique set of early career grants that you can take advantage of. So obviously many of you are familiar with um, you know, um, early stage investigators at NIH, and but many other types of even foundation grants have grant um, mechanisms that are specific to early stage investigators, and that clock is ticking, right? So you are going to have a couple of shots on goal, um, you know, for that period, and so it's really important to take advantage of that. Um, and so, you know, what you don't want to do is sort of just, you know, uh, get your papers and things and then have your first shot on goal be, you know, your last chance at one of these grants, right? Um, so, you know, you, you want a chance to get feedback and to revise your grants. It's all, you know, you're going to need feedback to revise your ideas and you should do that widely no matter what, internally, externally, however you can get it, whoever you can get to read something you've written, <laughs> you should take advantage of that um, because that's, that's really um, the, your best path towards, um, you know, not getting shot down by your, you know, your, your one submission. So my personal philosophy is to apply to lots and lots of grants <laughs> and as many as you can. Um, I know a lot of people think that that's, um, that's, you know, uh, not always time well spent. I've always found it to be extremely useful and I learn something every time I submit a grant um, mm-hmm. and every time I get feedback. So. Olivia. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think one thing that you need to remember is that the grant landscape now is very different than it was 10 years ago is very different than it was 20 years ago. And I think that it's important to remember when you are getting advice from senior faculty that what they experienced might not be what you have, what you are experiencing. And I will say that I think this is one of the real benefits of a community like UPI Slack, where you hear a lot, a lot of experiences from people who are at a very similar career stage as you. I am also of the opinion of just applying a lot because at the end of the day, that will help. I mean, you know, odds are odds, right? The more shots on goal that you take, the more likely you are to get a goal. And, you know, when we're talking about grants, we're not talking like you need 10 grants. You just kind of need a a couple wins, right? And then you're, and then you're off to the races. And so then you're really operating in the range of noise where increasing grant submissions is really going to help you there. Um, One piece of advice that I would say is it's really great if you don't need to write each grant from scratch. If you can recycle grants that you've written or change them in some ways or use the same preliminary data, that will make this idea of applying to a lot of grants a lot easier because writing 10 new grants from scratch in a year, I mean, I know that there are people out there who can do that. I am not one of those people, certainly. Um, And so certainly the way that I have what really helped was I, you know, had a grant that I submitted, got feedback back, <laughs> didn't get funded. I was like, okay, well, I can now incorporate that feedback. We have some new, new results. I, okay, I can like change things around a little bit and, you know, then we can send it off somewhere else. Um, the other thing that I would say is I actually think the process of writing grants is a great way of refining your ideas. There um, is a, one of my favorite books on writing is called Unwriting Well um, by Zinzer. 
And he talks a lot about how if you are not thinking clear, clearly, you will not be able to write clearly. And I think the, at, the, the act of putting your ideas on the paper, of trying to find the logic, of trying to order them, of trying to think about the rationale, you know, what is the significance? Those are, that's actually a really great exercise. And so I don't think it's grant versus trying to move your lab board. It's writing your grant and moving your lab board. These two activities are synergistic. The final thing that I will say is that we worry a lot about money because money is obviously really important, but I don't think that writing grants can be all that you're doing. I like to think about the, the activities of a PI. It's like you have this like a stock portfolio and you have many different kind of places where you're trying to, to, to you know, move things forward. On the one hand, this is really stressful because it feels like you have about 10 number one priorities, right? You have to get the lab up and going, you have to hire people, blah, 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 blah. Write grants, get papers. But I think maybe another way to think about it is you want to sort of be moving everything in all of those areas forward a little bit. And if you are finding that you're spending 100% of your time writing grants, my sus suspicion is that that's probably too much of your time. I don't know what the right percentage is. I know that 100% is too much. And then the final thing that I was going to say, one thing that I think has really changed in the grant landscape is bioarchive. And I cannot, I cannot recommend enough pre-printing your papers. Mm -hmm. in, you know, in the old days, it used to be you had a paper, you submitted it, and you know, who knows when it was actually going to come out. Well, like I now know it will be like 48 hours after I submit it to, to bioarchive, it will be online and readable. And for you, new PIs trying to show productivity, this is a really, really great way. If you want to get feedback on your work, pre-printing is a really great way. You, you know, you want to kind of move things forward, help attract postdocs and graduate students, pre-printing is a really great way. You want to learn more about your field, read preprints. I, it just, it's, this has really transformed the way that science can be done. And so I, I think this is something that all young investigators should embrace. And they can be cited anywhere where other research projects are cited in your NIH grants. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. That's good. I wanted to, full disclosure though, both Olivia and Prachi are funded by NIGMS, right? ESI Mira grants. Um, so just uh, please remember that uh, when you're applying for grants. Um, lots and lots of questions. Uh, we're not going to be able to get to everything. So we're going to eventually have to move to a lightning round pretty fast, but I want to take a little bit more time about this one because I thought it was really interesting and true. So, you know, here we have two outstanding future leaders of science. Um, I'm saying that, not you, uh, but this questioner also said it. Um, how do you feel and how do you navigate, you know, being in the faculty meeting room as the early career investigator, maybe also, you know, female, how do you deal with the politics of that and the dynamics of that? What are your thoughts? Since you're going to be in charge one day, you know, <laughs> you say, well, you know, wait till I'm in charge, then you're finished. But, you know, how are you thinking about that? I would say practice. So I think that it is an absolute, I think almost anything in science and related to doing science can be practiced, whether it's putting yourself out there or, um, you know, speaking up in faculty meeting or, you know, doing anything that you think is, is hard and maybe sort of some part of some intrinsic property, you may feel like, oh, well, you know, I'm not like that. You know, it's just hard for me and it's easier for other people. I would say any of those things that you would put into that bin is something that you can get better um, better at with practice. And so this is something that is 100% true for speaking up on, on different things. So I, I am often the most junior person in the room and for a lot of different things. And, um, and it took me a while to sort of train myself to think, you know, I really need to, you know, I'm here for a reason. I'm here because they want my opinion. And that's true for you and your faculty position too. You've been hired for a reason. Um, and so, you know, they want your opinion and it is your sort of, I think both your opportunity and your responsibility to speak up in those situations. And I understand people feel sort of vulnerable and you will get, I guarantee you, you will get the advice to keep quiet until tenure, which I, um, you know, I understand, but I disagree with. <laughs> um, and I often find that, you know, when you train yourself your entire career to wait until you're 
40 something years old to, um, to speak up that it's not so easy to turn that on like a light switch. It's, mm -hmm. you know, you probably are not going to then magically transform into a vocal person. So um, I would say you can also exercise that muscle earlier on and, you know, cautiously so, but you can definitely make your voice heard and you're there for a reason and practice speaking up, it will get easier. Um, so I think that when you do that, um, I've sort of found that making myself do that in those situations, um, when I get into other situations where I'm, I'm not the most junior person in the room, I, I worry that I'm a little overbearing and over talkative, <laughs> but because I've practiced that, you know, I've, I've flexed that muscle so often that, that, um, you know, it, it can come across differently in different circumstances, but I would just say that, that you can do it and you can get better at it. And I would, I would take advantage of your voice in that situation. Olivia. I mean, I completely agree with Prachi. I, I think anybody who knows me probably professionally or personally knows I am, I am not good at, at staying quiet when I see things large and small um, that bother me. And I think anyone who knows me would also know I have a really hard time not wearing my heart on my sleeve. And I will be honest, sometimes, sometimes it can feel like I wish I could be sort of more politically astute, right? Like somehow that would, that would, be better, but I, I actually, I sort of come around that I don't think that's true. Like, I think one of the things that I bring to the table is that I am really passionate about this and that I do care about not just doing science, but having the science, science as a field being a just field. Like that really, really matters to me. And to be honest, if at the end of the day, I have made publish all these papers, but I have done nothing to make science better. That's not what I want for myself. And I don't want to be, to be fully honest, to be fully frank, I don't want to be a person for whom that would be okay. And so at the end of the day, I, I feel like I just have to stay true to myself. And, you know, the part of me that's like, you know, just like burn it all down. Well, if people don't appreciate me, then, you know, maybe they're not people that I, I whose opinion matters that much to me because I think that this is how we make science sort of more just is by speaking up, is by having, having people sit at the table and use their voice. And I, one thing that I think about a lot, um, Manny Aritz, who's an RNA biologist at UCSC, he once said that, you know, when you speak, it doesn't have to be perfect, but if you don't speak, you're not gonna be part of the conversation. And if we don't use our voice, then our voices aren't going to be heard. That is so true. Please, all of you listening, don't listen to the advice about not speaking up until you get tenure, because we need you to speak up. Um, you know, I need you to speak up. The community needs you to speak up. Uh, they just don't want to, to hear the truth. So please do speak up. Um, we're going to go lightning round fast now. Problems with personnel. What's your advice? You got someone, two people don't get along, someone's not meeting expectations. What do you do? Prachi. That's an impossible question. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I, <laughs> I, yeah, right. So, so th there's no easy answer to this because it's definitely a case by case basis, but I think transparency is really important. Communication is really important. Make sure that you understand it's very easy to make assumptions in these sorts of circumstances, to not play favorites, things like that. It's really just important to have transparency and, and open communication. That's it. <laughs> Olivia. Uh, I also would say try to tackle it easier or earlier. It's a lot easier to sort of make a small change in trajectory than it is once you've gotten really off course. Being fair, being transparent, being really transparent with your expectations and giving feedback, both positive and negative, coming from a place of we're trying to be better together rather than I think you're wrong, do it my way. I think all of these things will help make the problems when they come up smaller. And then sometimes it won't work out and you may have to fire somebody. And, and that's okay. If you have sort of gone through this and that's where you end up, then I think don't be afraid to do that either. La Another. Last one, yeah, last really quick thing is that it's very common for people to be conflict diverse, but it is absolutely your job to resolve these types of issues. Yeah. So even though you just, we all want to just think about the science and not deal with person, you know, personality issues and things like that, it is 100% your job as the PI to make sure that you resolve these issues. So you can't sit it out. <laughs> Another thing we should be teaching in grad school, right? I mean, boy, do I wish I had learned that before I started my own lab. It took me 20 years. Um, 
So lots and lots of other questions. I think, Matt, if it's possible, can we capture the chat? Is that something we can do? Um, and then we yes. could figure out how to utilize that because there's some great questions here we're not going to have time to get to. And I do want to give both Prachi and Olivia time for a benediction here. Um, I'll, one more lightning question, then we'll have time for you know your big, big thoughts. Um, what's the one thing that you wish you had learned or done before you started your lab? Or that somebody had told you? Olivia? Oh man, it's tough because because there are so many so things. Many. <laughs> um, I um, you know, I think one thing that I wish I had internalized more was to believe in myself and my capabilities a lot more. I I look back and I and I wish that I had not been so so worried about failure or about rejection or about looking stupid, and that stopped me. From, from taking opportunities. So I, th I think I'm still learning that lesson the way we are not finished, but I think, I wish I had started that journey a little bit earlier. That was a good one, Prachi. Um, I guess I would say that, um, you know, we spend our entire training trying to figure out the right way to do something as if there is only one right way. Um, and I think that there are many, many paths to success. And, and I said it up front um, that, that we can decide what that path is for us. And no one knows us the way we do. Um, and no one knows our potential the way we do and our, our best, um, you know, our, our unique talents the way we do. And so we are best positioned to find that path forward. And so to have that faith in yourself that, that you can find that path. And even if it doesn't look like um, sort of the way that you're being advised to do it, um, you know, that again, you are often rewarded for taking those initiative um, to, to decide those things for yourself rather than punished for it. Great. All right. I want to give you each, we're, we're going to run a couple minutes over, but I'm, I'm in charge so I can let that happen. Uh, occasionally there's a use to being in charge. Um, I'd like each of you to just give, you know, final thoughts, a minute maybe on, you know, big picture. What, what should people be thinking? Who wants to start? Prachi, how about you? <laughs> sure, I'll just, yeah, I'll just say that, um, you know, just to conclude here, I know many of you still have open questions. So I know uh, both Olivia and I are on Twitter. And for me, that's a really great way to get hold of me. I promise I can answer any question that way or reconnect with you again. So um, anyone can feel free. I'm um, at Prachi AC on, on Twitter. Um, so when feel somebody free. asked PI Slack, how do you, how do you? Yeah, get um, so it, there's a, there's a website. Um, it's, it's new pi slack dot wordpress dot com. S L A C K. Is that yep, right? S L A C K. Yeah. Um, and so you can just go to the website, it'll tell you how to sign up and things like that. Um, yeah. So I guess, um, you know, I think I've given a lot of my big picture big picture ideas right there. And I said, and I would say that, um, you know, just don't be afraid to go outside your comfort zone. This is something that we, you know, I think probably you, all of you are sort of familiar with sort of um, putting your toe in the water there. Um, but, but every single day as my, you know, favorite thing about this job is that every single day is a new learning experience. It's always different. It's always new. We're always learning something different. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, to, to take this job as, as yet another learning experience, right? So we feel almost at every stage that, oh, I should already know how to do this. And, you know, I've, I've been trained to now be in this professional situation. But the truth is that no matter where you are in this career, no matter how far advanced you get, you are always doing that part for the first time and learning something new. So, um, you know, just to, to, to give yourself that break and to say, you know, I'm still learning and I have, and that will keep you open to learning new things and learning new things from people who are younger than you that have a lot to offer um, and, 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 and learning from a lot of different experiences that you're, you're going to um, come across. Um, and, you know, like I said, every single one of those things is going to be, um, you know, unique to you. There's going to be experiences that literally no one else has experienced that you're going to come across. So there is no user manual for any of those things, right? So no one can help you with those things. Um, so you're just going to have to learn by trial and error and um, to just, um, like Olivia said, have faith in yourself and, and and you'll all do great. Best of luck to you. Olivia? Yeah, I think actually Prachi and I came up with very similar concluding remarks. So what I would say is I think becoming a PI and starting a lab involves a lot of skills that you haven't been trained on, that are new, that there are new aspects of the job. So you're, now you're being a manager. Now you're having to think about how to be a mentor, not just to one person potentially, but to many people. How to think about budgets. There are all these different aspects to it. And I think if you approach 
approach this job as you are a student of it. You are, you are learning. Um, that that is a, and you are curious about how to do it better and you are not satisfied with where you are currently. I think these are all gonna really set you up for success. And what I always say to students, especially about writing is that, you know, where you are today doesn't have to be where you're going to be tomorrow. And in fact, I really hope that where we are tomorrow is better than where we are today because I don't want this version of me to be, to be my peak. I like to imagine that my peak like has yet to come. And like, in fact, I can't even see where I'm going to be because I'm so far away from it. To reach that, you have to keep on learning. You have to evaluate yourself. You have to be honest. And something that has been really, really helpful for me are following people that you respect on Twitter, hearing more about their scientific philosophies, reading papers really, really broadly, right? Like just, you're just trying to like be greedy for all the information that you can get to become better versions of yourself. And also read a lot of books. There are, you know, the business world has a lot of books about how to be a manager. It turns out being a manager is sort of being a manager. It doesn't really matter what discipline you're in. Why not read those books? Some of them are sort of ridiculous, but they might have a few pearls of wisdom that will make you a better manager. So like be greedy for those. Um, and I think also I would say at the end, be kind to yourself. It's okay not to be perfect every day. It's okay to make mistakes. That's how you know you're learning. If you're uncomfortable, that probably means that you're pushing yourself. Where there's friction, there's movement. I mean, I can like come up with a lot of sayings about this, but part of learning is making mistakes. And I think the most important thing is that any time you feel like you didn't do a good job or any time you make a mistake, you use that as a way to become better. And that's, it's always this sort of growth mindset. Um, I guess the final thing I'll say is, that, yeah, as Prachi said, I am also on Twitter. I am at Be a Scientist, um, which I clearly chose when I was feeling like very excited about science. Um, but I am, you know, if you have any questions, like please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. I'm also happy to like make more book suggestions on Twitter, probably more than we have time for right now. Um, but good luck. And it's really been a, a pleasure and a privilege to have this conversation with you today. And I'll say both their blogs are fantastic. I do urge you to look at them. Um, you know, listening to the two of you, I know things seem dark to all of us right now with everything going on, but listening to the two of you, uh, reading all the great questions, I feel like the future is actually going to be okay. So thanks for everything you're doing. Thanks for doing this. Um, and thanks all of you for participating. I really appreciate it. So, and we're going to try to capture everything in the chat and we will find something to do with all these great questions. So, Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.